Innovation Week, and I welcome you all. Uh, this session is called First Hand Knowledge, How Can Technology Improve Independence? And uh, my name is Susan Kirkland, and I will be the moderator for this session. Um, and uh, I am located in Halifax, Nova Scotia at Dalhousie University, and I am uh, uh, a member of the board of H12, but also an H12 researcher, and very pleased to have the opportunity to moderate this panel. And so, uh, with us today, we have uh, a number of older adults and or caregivers uh, who are going to be talking about technology in relation to independence. So I would just like to briefly introduce you to the speakers and then they will introduce themselves in a little bit more depth. So we're very pleased to have with us today uh, Lydia Froyo, who is from Montreal, Quebec, and John Hamblin, who is here with us today from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Marjorie Moulton, who is here with us today from uh, Victoria, BC, and Judy Tinning, who is here with us from Toronto, uh, Ontario. So as you can see, we have uh, uh, a national panel and, uh, and varying viewpoints. So we're very excited to have this opportunity to have the discussion uh, with you here. Um, I would like to begin with a brief land acknowledgement. I know that the land acknowledgement is uh, spoken at the beginning of every uh, day, but I think it's important, particularly given uh, the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation that we uh, celebrated for the first time last week and also uh, Treaty Day, that we really think about uh, where we are. And even though this is a virtual conference, we are on uh, uh, various lands of Indigenous peoples. Um, and we'd just like to reaffirm our commitment and our responsibility to improving relationships between nations and also to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their culture. So I'm personally situated uh, on the uh, uh, lands of uh, the Mi'kma'ki. Uh, with that, I'm just going to turn and um, this is, this is a, a discussion that we will be having today, but we have a number of points that we'd like to uh, convey to you. So uh, I will let the, the panelists speak. So the first question is really around um, what has what impact has technology had on your life or the life of uh, someone you care for in terms of being able to be more independent? And it, as you come to answer this question, I hope you will take the opportunity, uh, each of you, to explain a little bit about your own background in a little bit more detail and uh, how technology has has uh, impacted your life and and your uh, your independence either of your own independence or the independence of someone you uh, care for. Um, and maybe we could begin with Marjorie. Thanks, Susan. Um, yeah, so my name is Marjorie Moulton and I have the privilege of sitting on um, the Age Well Older Adult and Caregiver Advisory Committee as the Pacific Region Caregiver Representative. I'm also a dementia consultant um, focused on championing the work of caregivers. And um, I got into that field because of the multi-generational impact of dementia on my own family. Um, I was a support to my mother as a caregiver of my father um, who uh, died with Alzheimer's when I was just 24 years old. So it has had certainly a significant impact in, in my career path and, and choosing to move professionally into working with people with dementia and uh, their families and caregivers. So I started 15 years ago, a registered charity in Canada that operated here in Victoria, BC. And um, over you know, our 15 year history, we supported a number of families and caregivers and persons with dementia. And one of the supports that we were um, instrumental in bringing to Victoria and also the province of BC was um, wander prevention and location technology, wearable technology. Um, and so that really impacted the independence of the clientele that we worked with because it allowed for 
um, people with dementia to have a greater degree of autonomy um, and to remain independent and in their own home for longer. Uh, it also was helpful to the caregiver in that uh, it supported their peace of mind about their loved ones and uh, also, you know, ease their burden somewhat to, you know, lessen the, the possibility of caregiver burnout. So just to share a bit about how technology, particularly in the last year and a half, has impacted me personally um, and my own cohort, which is uh, around 50 to 75 years of age, there's a number of us. Um, we've certainly become, as many of us have, big fans of Zoom in order to stay connected. Um, and so a year, a little over a year and a half ago, I started hosting a virtual Friday afternoon happy hour with uh, our friends. And um, that's become such a staple of our social lives that even now, all this time later, when we're all um, fully vaccinated and can gather uh, together in person, we continue to meet on a weekly basis. So it's, it's really augmented our social interaction. That's really lovely, thank you. Uh, John, let's move over to you. Hi there, uh, I'm John Hamblin. I'm actually in St. John, New Brunswick, so I represent another province this, today. Uh, I, as you can tell by looking at me, I also fit in the seniors category quite well. I'm about to turn 75. Four years ago, I was living alone in a Arizona community, and I went to a Boxing Day sale at Walmart and bought a Google Home Mini. Hadn't used one before, but my background is in technology for many, many years. I took it back to my place, plugged it in, went through how it worked, and learned to love it. I uh, use it every day to say, what's my day? It tells me what's coming up, what events I have planned, like this one. It told me today I was talking this afternoon, even though I had trouble getting on. And uh, as a result of that, I said, my God, this would be really handy for seniors long before COVID but I knew then from previous contact with seniors that social isolation, particularly in the winter, was a major problem because seniors, are, many seniors are frail, afraid to go outside, slip on the ice. And some of the ones I know haven't, don't go out at all during the winter months. So I contacted Google directly and convinced them that we should do a pilot in Nova Scotia. And I, they provided 35 devices and some new software they were testing. And I gave this out to 35 seniors living independently around the province. The results of this, again, as I said, long before COVID, uh, six month pilot were that all of the seniors who were on it were just amazed at how they could get information, how they could make phone calls for free uh, using the Google device and listen to their news. If they had problems with eyesight, they could have the news read to them. It was just amazing. And, and of the 35, all but one said that if we took it out at the end of the survey, they would go and buy another one. They were that impressed with it. Uh, further to that, I got involved in a project for helping severely uh, mobility challenged people use smart devices to access everything from their not smart bed that happened to be electric, but wasn't a $25,000 smart bed to their opening their door to turning on the light and the fan. And this project, which is still proceeding and which Susan happens to be uh, very much involved in, uh, you know, has been life changing for these people. My, my current uh, involvement is in smart technology and its value to seniors in all respects. I do some training there. I'm actually authoring a course right now for aged care technology that is going to be given, uh, provided to home care workers to explain to them the basics of smart technology and its value both in telehealth and for seniors covering everything from uh, communications to sensors. Uh, you know, I, I personally, my goal in life, much like the goal of age well, is to help seniors to age well wherever they may be, whether it be in their home, living independently, which most of us want to do, or in some sort of facility. And uh, I think that uh, this type of session is phenomenal. And I think that there are a lot of things that we need to do to allow seniors to 
benefit all seniors, diverse, whether they're rich, poor, you know, to, to take advantage of these uh, smart technology. Now, I, my last comment will be, I have no feeling that smart technology will ever replace the human touch. And there's no question that having a care worker or a loved one come and give you a hug sure as hell beats listening to me on a computer. But the fact is that this is a huge plus, particularly for those who are isolated. Thanks, John. I do think that that's a very important distinction that you make. And, you know, so many of us take for granted technology in our own homes, but it's a completely different environment when you move into institutional care and the same sort of, you know, what we consider to be basic rights that we have in our own home don't always get translated into care. So that's a, a really important uh, issue. Lydia, yes. please tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, your relationship with technology. Uh, first, I want to thank you for that last comment because um, I'm going to take this uh, uh, more from the um, the residents, especially the residences um, for assisted living, um, which is where my mom is right now, subsequent to a fracture, a hip fracture, um, in four years ago when she lost her mobility and. Um, and so the technology with her is really to enhance her well-being since that she suffers from macular degeneration. So she has um, a lot of other issues um, that mean that require her to have help and assistance for turning on the TV, for the volume of the radio and the music that she adores, et cetera. So I do appreciate that. My name is Lydia Froyo, and um, as stated, I uh, am a Montrealer and have lived and worked all my life in Montreal and in second language teaching. It is um, a passion of mine. I began my interest in computers and language learning back um, in the days of the first Mac. So those of you might remember that. And <laughs> at the same time, I was uh, fortunate enough to be supported in the production and development of various language learning software over the years through my college and actually through the Ministry of Education in Quebec. At the residence now, it's a, it's a different focus because um, there are independent people, meaning they're mobile, they can come and go, they have um, a, a, what we consider a, a, you know, a, a more active life. Um, and my focus is really on them, but also on those who cannot do for themselves and must rely on uh, staff in the residence to, to fulfill the functions that a caregiver cannot do 24 seven, cannot do um, uh, as Marjorie so aptly put. Um, there are things that have to be done to support caregivers. In, in their tasks and what they do. Um, if I talked a little bit about the impact of technology, uh, the context of a Quebec assisted living environment is one, um, my mother has lived in two different ones in the last four years. And um, that is just because of location to me and I had asked for her to be transferred and now she's like a, a 10 minute walk away. And the technology really was non-existent, is non-existent. And um, uh, for example, Wi-Fi was um, finally installed in the residence where she lives now um, just this winter. And that means that caregivers now have the autonomy and the ability given their own personal technology and devices to offer all everything that the internet can do to enhance their well-being. Um, 
what I've noticed is that the uh, residents who do have smartphones and are able to manage on their own have very little support. Um, and, and it is unfortunate and it's very hard. How do you, how, how do you start that kind of um, uh, promotion within the walls of one institution? And that is what I'm trying to do little by little, but it's a very tiny steps. As a member of a caregiver association, this, which is how I, I came in contact with AgeWell, um, there has been a shift from in-person meetings, of course, like everywhere else. And, and so the challenge to those caregivers who depend in on these um, meetings, these in-person meetings, could no longer manage them. And unfortunately, the training has also to go to the people who have suddenly had to shift from doing things in person to doing things online and to use the, um, the, the options available to them in all these software platforms. So right now, that's where I'm at. And um, thank you for inviting me. Wonderful. Thank you. And we'll pick up on some of those themes as we go along. And I know that the things that you've been saying have resonated with uh, the group as well, because the chat is starting to uh, pick up. Uh, Judy, let's introduce you. So my name is Judy Tinning. I'm a, a wife, a mother of two, a grandmother of four. And I have come to technology very, very reluctantly. Our sons are 45 and 48, so there certainly have been computers in the house since the mid-1980s, but I didn't see any particular use for them for myself professionally at that point. And um, so I didn't really pay very much attention to what they were up to, but it certainly enhanced their school experience. When we retired in 1999, we became a little bit more involved with technology, and now we have a desktop, an iPad, an iPhone, and a Kobo. Um, but it isn't something that we use instinctively. But initially, I used it for communication, so there was lots of email, I did lots of research, you know, how grandmothers do genealogical research and things like that. And as technology has progressed, I have discovered the wonders of ebooks and e transfers, along again with um, email and with Googling. But the pandemic sort of changed everything for us. We've always, in our retirement, worked really hard to have the appropriate balance in our life a balance between work, cultural activities and intellectual activities. But all of a sudden, the social aspect of our lives changed quite dramatically, and it became really important to remain compliant and to be relatively safe. My husband has Parkinson's disease, and he is doing extraordinarily well, but we needed to make our home work better for us and our interactions with society to be a little smoother. So I learned how, without uh, some difficulty, to order groceries, <laughs> to bank online, and to um, accept the reality of virtual health appointments, which actually have been extraordinarily beneficial. And it's interesting that when a doctor is looking at you on the screen, that they pick up all kinds of cues. So while I didn't think it was going to work out really well, it has worked out very, very well. So in terms of work, which when you are older and retired, it's more about exercise. We do dancing with Parkinson's. I take a class in LDOA. In terms of education, we've always been really keen on seniors education. We go to lifelong learning and retirement at York University. And now instead of being able to take one course per term, we can take four courses. We can take everything at the convenience of our home. So that's worked out really well. Um, we attend the monk debates and monk dialogues. We've learned um, 
how to deal with all kinds of webinars. The Globe and Mail's put out a really interesting series. We listen to podcasts. We attend the theater through the National Theater Live, uh, Stratford at Home. We attend their programs as well. Um, Music Toronto, the TSO, the Against the Grain Opera Company have all had really interesting things to do on Zoom. We belong to East York Probus, so we can attend the general meetings. We can play bridge online with them if we want to, take a cooking class. I play bridge online with other friends as well. I was actually encouraged in my role as a reluctant grandmother with technology to co-author um, <clears throat> with my daughter-in-law and her mother a blog that we put out every week last year for about six months called Menograms and the effect of technology and how we were able to use technology um, in our lives. I participated in some preliminary research um, for virtual reality, which was also a very interesting. And, and fortunately, they had a lot of technological support, so I was able to do that. But, book clubs. Zoom has worked out beautifully to connect with the quilting group, to connect with friends on a regular basis, to see our grandchildren who live in Kelowna. And then we've always really enjoyed traveling. So now we're traveling on the web. We watch Rick Steves and for 25 minutes, you know, you can see something really cool. And we went to the Faroe Islands because they have virtual tourism. And we watch tons and tons of documentaries on programs like TVO. So while the pandemic has certainly brought so many challenges to us, we feel really fortunate that we've been able to access, even in our limited way, all of the things that technology has really brought to us and really enhanced our lives. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, you can see what a great group of panelists we have um, and also the range of their experiences um, and, and how technology has worked out. But, you know, it really um, resonates that, you know, technology can be both a blessing and a curse. And, you know, it, it does open up an enormous world and uh, allows us to do things that we might not be able to do in other circumstances, especially in light of the pandemic. And we've learned so much about technology in the face of the pandemic. But there's this downside as well, which is really around um, like how do you how do you operate technology and how do you how do you uh, allow people uh, the supports that they need? And so that really brings us to the next question that I'd like to ask you. And that is, what are the supports that you think people need um, for to help older adults um, use technology to increase their independence? Uh, Marjorie, do you want to start off with that? Sure, Susan. Thank you. And Judy, I'm, I feel like I, I need to get online and do more. You're so inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you go to work. <laughs> I just thank you for home. that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, we all need support with technology. So it's not strictly about um, older people requiring support. Anytime any of us are trying to learn something new, there's a learning curve, right? So um, it's important, I think, to remember that, that that, uh, that 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 learning curve applies to all when it comes to something new. And certainly around technology, that's the case. And um, so, you know, in order to adopt it, we do need those supports. Um, and oftentimes we hear about this digital divide, right, that becomes a barrier for people accepting um, technology into their homes, into their lives. Um, and that, th that divide to me comes in several different forms. Um, one of them is accessibility, right? And when I say accessibility, I'm talking about how accessible is the internet to you in your own personal situation? Um, do you have Wi-Fi? Uh, what's your access to various um, smart devices, tablets, phones, computers, 
whatever sources you, you know, Alexa, I mean, um, Google Home, I mean, everybody has maybe a slightly different way that they might like to interact with the technology, which means different types of technologies. So how accessible are those technologies? And that also means socioeconomical accessibility too, right? Can we afford, um, you know, in our individual situations, the costs that come along with, with these devices? Um, you know, John, you spoke about someone who, you know, in your group that said, well, I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily go out and buy one of these devices that I've been using. And maybe that was a cost thing or something else. We don't know, but that's certainly a barrier. Um, there's also a barrier around infrastructure. I mean, depending on where you live, if you happen to live in an urban environment and you have good sort of Wi-Fi, internet access, all those things, wonderful. But if you're in a rural area, um, that might not be the case and none of those devices might, you know, function for you in that regard. And, and Lydia, I appreciate the fact that, you know, you're talking about what I would like to add to those divides and that is, um, that digital divide that comes in between people who are living in um, a care residence versus in their own home. Um, because there's also that divide too that's becoming more and more apparent all the time. Um, that, that for people who are living in those congregate settings, they might not have the access to the technology, the access to the support or any of those things. And finally, um, just the continuing support, training, education for people to learn these new technologies and be able to utilize them. So that includes um, online, by phone, in person, whatever ways we can reach people to break down some of these barriers. That's really great. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, John, I'm going to turn it over to you now because I know you have a lot of experience in this area and uh, we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Okay, well, uh, over the last several months, I've been uh, bitten by the equity bug. And equity really means having the, same, the opportunity to get what you need when you need it. It's not giving everybody the same thing. It's not giving all seniors $750 because a lot of seniors don't need it and a lot need a lot more. The problem with smart technology is there's no equity at all at the present time. There's two issues. One is that there are a lot of people who can't afford it. 40% of seniors are on the GIS, which means their total income is less than $20,000 a year. They're not going to buy an internet. They're not going to buy even a very cheap many, they need to be supported by the government. The other one, which Marjorie was already talking about, is training. And training for people needs to be done. It can be done virtually if they're smart enough to get on virtually. It can be but it. In fact, you know, what we've started pushing for and part of this course that I was developing for home care workers is there actually should be a new class of home care worker who is a technology support worker who goes to the home and helps the senior with whatever issues they have, just as you would have one who gives them a bath or someone who feeds meals or whatever else. And these should be subsidized by the government. The internet issue is certainly still a problem in rural areas, but the government is throwing, you know, if you look at both the federal and provincial governments, probably $2 billion into the pot to provide access and I firmly believe that within two years, access will be pretty well available everywhere. But the access is nothing if you can't afford to buy it and if you don't know how to use it. So the issues really revolve around training. And you know, we have two projects in Atlantic Canada, one that involves uh, getting uh, community college students in technology to visit seniors and others for that matter and help them set up their technology and work with them and answer problems they have. And the other one in New Brunswick, which is starting shortly, is actually using very bright high school students to go in and help out. And within communities, a lot of communities have people who are quite keen on technology, know what they're doing, who are seniors or not seniors, who can support others. I think, uh, as Susan would attest to in the 
uh, project that's been done at Northwood for severely mobility challenged people, there are a couple of champions coming out of the group that are severely mobility challenged. One lady has been, uh, uh, mob you know, a, I don't like to use the word uh, disabled, but in fact, has been a quadriplegic for 20 plus years, but she leaped at the opportunity to be able to do things on her own. And she is now training others in how to do it and supporting them when they have problems. It's really, the, the whole issue is, well, there's, the two issues are getting people trained in whatever way is possible and setting up programs within individual communities and getting the government to recognize that both in long-term care facilities and in the homes, the seniors need to be subsidized and supported if they need it. Long-term care facilities don't have the internet infrastructure bandwidth to support everybody, but they need it. In a recent age well conference that I was at, day, one day conference, one of the speakers said, smart technology used to be a nice to have, but it should now be a right for all. And that's where we have to go. Yeah, those points really resonate with me, as you know, John. And um, I don't want to take over my my moderator role to be a speaker, but um, one of the things that we've noticed in um, in Northwood is, you know, it's not just enough to provide the technology. That's just one thing, but the ongoing support is absolutely critical. And we've actually come up with a new role for. In, in fact, it is a technology rehab service um, to work with um, the residents to make sure that they're uh, able to use it and, and using it in the way that they, they want to. Thank yeah, you very I, much. Yeah, I, I will say just on that note that, you know, this technology support that I mentioned about home care workers is needed even more in long-term care facilities because in fact, most long-term care facilities have one or two tech people and that's all they have on staff. They're not geared to supporting the internet and supporting these devices, and they don't have the time or the budget. So there has to be a role established, which Susan is working on in the, in the project at Northwood, that is more universal that everybody has, whether it's in a long-term care facility or in home care. And it's really about the technology human interface too. So, you know, sometimes IT people they have the technology side, but it's the interface that I think is so critical. Lydia, I'm going to uh, uh, ask you about your uh, thoughts on supports that are needed. You're on mute. Thank you, I'm sorry about that. It's a long, long road, at least in Quebec in the institutions and and it's not just the public um it's a uh, far cry from what um, the residents need and what uh, caregivers and family members would appreciate um, i can give you an example that um, as we speak it is impossible to leave voicemail um, on my mother's floor so um that in itself is a mountain to climb and um, um, Marjorie and others have spoken about the, um, the effect on caregivers and what that means for them. And so, you know, having access to what, how long have we had voicemail, we count on it, it's so useful. We don't necessarily have the email addresses of the head nurse or other people in charge. Um, and as you mentioned, Susan, IT does what is necessary for the functioning of the staff and the building and the caregiving and the administration, et cetera, et cetera, it has nothing to do with the residents and certainly nothing to do with or for the caregivers. So, and on that, uh, John has already mentioned the affordability um, I said that uh, luckily there is now Wi-Fi where my mom lives, but I have no idea if it's in the entire network of our geographical area or not. Were we just lucky? I don't know. What I do notice is that there is no information telling people 
telling uh, new residents arriving, their families, others, that we are now a Wi-Fi area you can, you know, connect to X, Y, Z. And so it's almost like this well-guarded secret. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, I might have, that in the whole building where there, there are six floors of residents and about 175 of them, there's one computer available. And so one of the things that I would think would work and would help is to have um, a kind of a lending library for those because of affordability in uh, this particular residence and in this part of the city, um, and, and I would guess in most everywhere, affordability is a huge problem, um, including the uh, safeguarding of these devices. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, things, things move around and things disappear and, um, and, and given that, then it's necessary to look at other ways of doing things and, um, uh, the lending of, of, um, eBooks for those people who still have their vision and can handle this, um, uh, it's a straightforward um, application to use. Um, uh, they can get books from their local library um, if, you know, they, they, and of course, I benefit from the ebooks because now I'm uh, following in my mother's footsteps, it looks like, and my vision requires that I need larger and larger fonts. And that is just, um, a godsend. Um, in terms of training, what John says is true. There has to be training. It has to be appropriate to the person. And at the same time, there are people within the walls who are not staff, who are caregivers, who are family, um, who would be willing to do a buddy system exchange where spend a little time with someone and give them the keys because once they have the key to the technology, uh, they're good to go. And, and that's the good thing about it is that um, they can only, you know, go from there once they have the the right um, the right instruction, the right information, have the right support. Whether it just be hints written down on a page, something they could refer to every time they log on somewhere anything simple that would help the residents. Those are really good points that you make, Lydia. And, um, you know, you talked about safeguarding and there, there's safeguarding of the physical equipment, but there's also a safeguarding of privacy that's an issue as well. And um, this is something that, you know, we talk about and we're, you know, we're quite paranoid about privacy in some settings, um, but also too, we, we forget that, you know, uh, we've given over our privacy and it's very, very important that you understand what you're giving over, but most people actually don't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we need to have a better understanding of privacy, both within our own home and our own devices, as well as when we go into uh, group settings. It's very important. Judy, is there anything you'd like to add? Um. <clears throat> I think it's it's interesting. John and I are more or less the same age. I'm just a tiny bit older than he is. And my husband is going to be 80 in his next birthday. And I think we're sort of at an interesting spot that if we were, and I'm just guessing that Lydia's mother is possibly 15, 20 years older than I am. So it was never part of her life. It was part of my life, just not very successfully. But when I look at people Marjorie's age coming up, you know, they are so used to technology. So it'll be interesting to see how all of this impacts on everything. The other thing that came up this morning on the radio was the number of ethnocentric care homes. And they were speaking particularly about Copernicus, which is a Polish care home. So what do you do when the majority of the people who live there 
maybe do not have easy command of English, the people who work there are speaking in Polish to them to find sufficient people representing different language groups who can help with training. I think that's a really big issue as well. We're really lucky that our <clears throat> eldest son has his own business. It's tech, it's a tech business and he has team viewer. So when I really have a problem, he can solve it like that because I give him permission to get into the computer and we work it out together and nobody's had to do anything but spend a few minutes together. So, but that's, that's very fortunate. I think the other issue too is that <clears throat> we have a lot of friends in that 75 to 85 group who either use technology really well who, or who are so disinterested that they have never purchased it, they have never learned, and during the pandemic they have relied on their neighbors to organize their appointments for their shots. And I don't know how you capture people like that who see no use at all in it because there must be a significant number of them. Very good point. And you know, it's interesting around um, the point you make about ethnocentric care homes as well. And you know, we have such a reliance on things like Alexa and Google um, that, you know, use the English language and not only just use the English language, like you have to speak pretty clearly as well. And so people who have, you know, speech disabilities or, or um, impediments also have a more difficult time. And how do we manage that? Very good points. Thank you all. Um, I do have one last question for you, and I'm hoping we can have time to cover it. I think we do. And that is um, related to the question that Judy asked, and it's around diversity. And so how do you think we can increase the diversity of older adults and caregivers that, in, that are involved in designing technology so that, in fact, it does better support um, older adults' independence? And uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll put that to you first, Marjorie. Yeah. So I mean, since I'm my role has been a caregiver over the years, both personally and professionally, um, I I just will speak to it in terms of like how do we reach caregivers um, and get them involved in in the process? So. I really think that a big part of that is trying to find out where they are at, whoever they might be, right? Um, they might be associated with um, different support organizations, um, they might be online, but trying to figure out where those caregivers are, who they are, and how we can engage them better depending on their needs. Because one of the things as a caregiver that you're continually challenged by is time. Um, you know, and so as much as you might like to um, be involved in, in various things, uh, 24 hours in the day just doesn't seem to be enough often um, when you're caring for someone. And so um, things that ease that burden of, of time that, sort of come to you rather than you needing to seek them out uh, can certainly go a long ways towards helping caregivers. And certainly speaking from my own personal experience, I've become more involved in helping and supporting other caregivers since I'm no longer at this moment a caregiver myself, because when I was fully immersed in that world, it was, it was difficult to, um, to find the time to to do that so um reaching them where they're at and finding ways to help sort of ease that that burden of care and particularly around time i think would be a very helpful thing yeah really important points thank you john i'm going to move on to you on the issue okay. of diversity. yeah <laughs> yeah i unmuted myself you know i think and i've been listening to all the other speakers too and you know i think the you know, there are major issues in allowing everyone to benefit from this. And I firmly believe that all seniors have the right to age wherever they may be, as well as they possibly can and enjoy life as much as possible, whether it's at home or in a long-term care facility. There are definitely language issues and 
<clears throat> you know, I know because uh, I do talk fairly regularly with people at Google and, and Amazon that they are working on diligently on implementing those devices in other languages and, and specifically allowing them to understand accented English, let us say, or weak voices better. You know, but there's much to be done there. Uh, for those who have mobility challenges, uh, you know, I think they require a different type of solution. If they happen to be a quadriplegic and can't use many types of devices, we have to provide them with what they can use. And there's the issue which we keep all revolving around is money. You know, and many seniors can't afford these devices. We can get around the internet access by providing better access. We can get around the training in a variety of different ways. But the fact is that, you know, and if you look at the advantages of keeping someone in the home as opposed to moving into a long-term care facility, it saves the government $100,000 a year. If it's somebody who can't afford the long-term care, well, it costs a lot less than that to provide them with excellent internet support and the proper devices. Now, when we're talking about devices, I will say there's a lot of time spent on hugely complicated, big devices. You know, like I, in my house, I have an Amazon Flex, which costs $15, plugs directly into an outlet and allows you to have access to all the Amazon voice related things from asking questions, phone calls, etc. So you don't have to spend a ton of money and once it's installed, you don't have to have any technical expertise. You know, you give them a nice cheat sheet that lists how you do different things there, and it works. You know, an Amazon, and I'm not an Amazon salesperson, but an Amazon show for roughly $100 allows you to do Zoom, Skype, access YouTube, do, as one of the people mentioned in a question, drop in where I can connect through the drop-in facility to my mother, and if my mother was still alive, <laughs> hard to connect to her, but you know, through the drop-in facility almost instantaneously and vice versa. So you know, I think when you're looking at technology, you've got to look at, and one of the panelists mentioned is look at the specific needs of the person, what they require and how it works, and we should be able to do it. And the government has to wisen up and realize that subsidies in these areas, both in long-term care facilities and in the home are worth their weight in gold. Uh, I think the point that you make of technology as a right is sort of increasingly being felt and you know, it's, it's an important point. Lydia, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I, I, I'd like to thank John for that last comment, <laughs> if I understood it. Um, yes, it's true. It took uh, the Quebec government um, two months in 2020, two very, very long, painful months when the residences were shut down and caregivers were banished from their premises. And so um, there is much, much that we learned and experienced in the last um, year and a half. And um, I can only hope that for those people uh, or those of us who may, um, may not be able to age in place quite the way we dream of. This was not in my mother's plan and it was just a, a very ordinary movement that um, created this change in her life. And, and yes, Judy, my mom is 95. <laughs> yes, yes. And so, but she's now very fragile, but was always a very independent woman and finds it very difficult, very, very difficult adapting to dependency. Yeah, and I think so, the point that you make, Lydia, that nobody, plan, nobody plans out their life like that, like no. that's not how you want it to go. Yeah, thank you. Um, I am noticing that we're, we've got 10 minutes to go. So, um, and I know we have to sort of wrap it up a little bit before that. So I'm going to maybe give you each a minute or so 
to uh, just give us some final thoughts. And um, if you have one key message that you'd like to leave with uh, the audience, that would be great. Judy, can I start with you? Um, yes. So I was quite intrigued with what John had to say as well, because as I mentioned, uh, my husband, Phil, has Parkinson's. And things that we have purchased, like a Kobo, like an iPhone, he did have his own, but he had to give it up, even though we bought an iPhone 10, believing that it was sufficiently large enough for him to operate it, he couldn't. And he can't operate an e-reader particularly well. So I hope that Amazon and Google and all of these other places are talking individually to societies that represent um, people with these different infirmities, whether you've got ALS or Parkinson's or essential tremors or whatever. And I think too, I mean, there's been a very definite call to action that we have to do something politically to make some very dramatic changes because I'm sorry, I'm sufficiently cynical to think that all of the monies that are required are not necessarily going to go towards the seniors in our society. So um, anyway, I'd rather end on a happy note. Thank you. This has been really, really interesting. So. Great. Thanks, Judy. Lydia, any final comments or key messages? Uh, well, on, on a positive note, I would have to say, I hope it's positive, every little step counts. And I, I say that because that really is the reality of caregiving in these homes, um, in assisted living, and um, having the courage to um, step away from the disappointment and to find a way to effect even the smallest change is worthwhile because it is an upward battle. Thank you. Marjorie, any final comments or key messages to the audience? Um, I think for me, it's, it's that we really need to recognize the role of the caregiver in the circle of care and how absolutely important that is and essential that is. I think during this past time of COVID and in places like um, long-term care residents and things like that, when, when caregivers were not able to come in and the residents were, uh, you know, these care homes were struggling um, to support the residents, uh, it really uh, drove home the importance of just how much caregivers do, that even if your loved one is not with you at home any longer, you are still an essential part of the caregiving team and you play a huge role in that. So I really think that that needs to be recognized and understood um, on all levels by all organizations, uh, governmental and otherwise, and then, and then in long-term care and those uh, places as well. And uh, the last thing too for me is always, I really think it's important for us to keep our focus when it comes to aging on quality over quantity. I mean, um, living long uh, is a nice goal, but um, I really think that living well should ultimately be the goal for all of us. Well said. John, would you like the last word? <laughs> yeah, well, I won't go over again how I think the governments are missing the boat entirely. And and I will point out to the governments, if anybody in the government is listening, that 53% of the economy is controlled by people over 55. And most of the businesses are, so they better wisen up. The people 55 are soon going to be in the same position that I am, old. And, and the fact is that, you know, I think equity is key. And, and I, I do work a lot with startups as a, as a mentor and an advisor and occasionally investor. And I'm always pushing startups to look at niches that are underserviced in the seniors world. And that would be those with mobility issues, those with language issues. And, but I also feel that in general, 
technology has to be integrated with both home care and long-term care as a specific function of staff. So it's not just left in abeyance and people don't have to fend for themselves. Thank you so much. And if I am allowed a, a, a reflection, I think from myself, I would uh, comment that older adults and caregivers have a wealth of experience and knowledge that can really contribute to this area. And if you see the richness of the conversation today, you'll understand exactly uh, how that information could be used in ways that are are very, very useful in technology research and development and also uh, technology advocacy, because I really do believe that technology, the use of technology is a right for people and, um, and that it's a very big equity issue that we will be facing over the next uh, number of years. Can John, I, your hand yeah, I just wanted to make, it's not exactly a sales pitch, but since this is an age well event, I'm on the AgeWell Industry Advisory Council aimed at building smart tech for seniors, basically. And AgeWell and our committee have produced a couple of really neat documents that are on the AgeWell site that discuss what is needed for technology to be implemented in the homes and care facilities for seniors. So check out the AgeWell site. Thank you. Um, I would like to just thank all of our presenters, um, Judy, Lydia, Marjorie, and John. You've done an amazing job of highlighting the important issues, and uh, I hope the audience enjoyed it. I really did myself, and I really thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Stay well.